Good morning, guys. Happy Monday to you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good, thank you. So today we are starting chapter four. Now the uh, sapling homework was due this morning, right? Some, uh, some people ask me about the um, connection between sapling homework and, and our lectures. So, so just to clarify a few things, um, with the lectures we cover quite a bit of material, but don't expect that we'll cover everything. So what I, I do not like to rush through this stuff in my lectures just, just with the purpose to cover everything and, um, and make you fall asleep. So what we try to do, we try to focus on some specific aspects of the material, which I find either more difficult or more interesting or um, um, <clears throat> something that uh, will help you get the most out of the lecture. But then the sapling will sort of uh, fill the gaps, right? So if we haven't covered something, but you see it on sapling. So remember, sapling is an open book um, homework, right? You have to do it by yourself. You, in other words, you can't do it in groups. That's the big, that's the limitation. But it's an open book homework. So if you see something that, um, that you haven't, uh, that wasn't discussed in lecture, so that's why you bought the textbook. That's why you bought the textbook, right? So um, find that aspect of the material in the textbook, read about it and do the sampling, sampling problem. But also sampling by itself uh, has a lot of um, learning features Right, so this multiple attempt um, approach, where basically, which basically makes you think, right? And eventually it gives you a solution, it gives you lots of hints, gives you a solution. So sapling stands out by itself as a learning a tool. So uh, I would say that in this class, I we kind of already mentioned that, but maybe it was, um, you know, the beginning of the class, it was uh, just you were, um, not quite clear of what to expect. So we have three major learning tools in this class, right? So there are lectures, there's sampling homework, and there is the textbook. So uh, it is recommended that you all, you use all three uh, to do well in this class, right? And uh, you should be expecting, um, as far as the exam, you could be, you could, you should be expecting uh, questions from any of those three uh, sources of material. Right. What I will do is um, uh, I will make a practice test. Well, it's not going to be a long practice test. Just uh, I'll make some uh, set of problems which will be representative of what you could see on the actual test on September 30th. And I'll upload it to, um, to Canvas so that you have some expectation. And uh, hopefully that will help you also to focus your study a bit more. Uh, do you have any questions about the structure of uh, of the of the of what I um, of what is expected from you in this class? Of what uh, what kind of material and what kind of knowledge I want you to gain? I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, like, what do you expect us to take away from the textbook and lectures <laughs> and the homework? Like, you want to take away concepts, the equations, things like that, or? No, so things that I, um, so I obviously don't want you to memorize, that's one thing. I want you to think. I want you to, to get the minimum amount of information, which will allow you, which will give you um, a good platform for you to start thinking, right? So I mean, I asset alphabet, that's something that you have to, you have to know, because otherwise without the alphabet, you cannot write sentences, right? You cannot um, um, make, write an essay. So um, I mean, I asset alphabet, that's, a, that's, that's something that you do need to know. And other things is just like, uh, you can see that we have not really introduced any new concepts in this class. It's all based on general chemistry and organic chemistry that you've had before. Right. So for that reason, you can see also on sapling, um, I left quite a few of the general chemistry questions 
for this chapter three, even though we not, didn't really go over them in class because there was no, I mean, in the lecture, because there was no reason. You already had that in general chemistry, right? But I left some of these uh, um, calculations as far as pHs and um, pKa's and just for you to, um, to, to solve these problems again from general chemistry and just to uh, remember how to do this again because that will help you in this class. So uh, what I expect from you is the minimum amount of memorization just sufficient to start thinking on your own, right? You need to know things like um, London dispersion forces. You need to know dipole-dipole interactions. You need to know hydrogen bonds, right? You need to, you need to know ionic electrostatic interactions, hydrophobic effect. We've gone over the, over this. So if you know um, what these terms mean and the nature of these terms, they will, they will make you think. They will make you think. And that's why I keep encouraging you guys to participate more in the, in the discussion forum on the Canvas. Um, this is exactly where I, I want you to start thinking. Um, that's why I give you all these um, problems for thought, food for thought in terms of, you know, resonance effect of amides versus esters and things like that. Because um, it's not so much about memorization, it's about actually understanding. Right, more understanding, more conceptual thinking, less memorization. And um, that's what I would expect. Anything else? So on this uh, previous sapling homework, we had uh, we had a fair amount of questions that were really math heavy. Um, mm -hmm. And I was trying to, I was in the textbook, I was trying to look and see, you know, where the textbook broke it down and wa walked through it. But a lot of it was just, you know, a lot of things were alluded to. Um, and they didn't really break down how to do some of the math in it or not, not even the math, just like, oh, you need to use this formula or do this. Um, yeah. Are we, are we going to see questions like that on the exam? Right. So probably not. I will, uh, the exam time is quite limited and I don't want to waste it for you guys to do math. Right. So this is something that, um, what you also have to realize that is, um, when you do this math at the end, what comes at the end is your understanding. Right. So, um, so when you do the math and it asks you at what pH, for example, this lysine will be protonated, will be deprotonated, right? At the end of the day, I want you to understand that, uh, um, that half of the lysine will be protonated when the pKa equals pH. And, when you, and uh, if the pH is lower than the pKa, then most of the lysine will be protonated. If the pH is higher, then lysine will be neutral. If you get the results at the end of your math exercise, and these results match these uh, predictions, that's what I want you to get. So in other words, uh, as far as the test, that's the understanding I want you to have, right? So to be able to, um, to, be able to connect the pH with pKa values, and, uh, so, and then I ask you, what will happen if you put this amino acid in this pH how much of it will be protonated? Which groups will be protonated if I give you pKa values, right? What's the isoelectric point at which um, the amino acid will not move in the electric field? So um, that understanding is what is required. Math behind it is just for you to, to get to this final result, which will confirm your prediction. Okay, so thank you. on the test, yeah, I will probably not bother you so much with math and uh, I'm sure you, you don't want to see it either. So, um, uh, but if you've done the math, if you've done the, uh, if you've done all these exercises, then um, you should be all prepared. So, anything else? All right. So we're done with amino acids, peptides, and proteins, primary structure, right? 
and we're moving on to chapter four. So let me switch to share screen. Share screen. All right. <clears throat> As usual, we start with the learning goals. So what are we expecting to, uh, to learn from this chapter? Well, um, it comes down to peptide bonds. So this is where we start, right? So all proteins at the core have peptide bonds. And so to know, this, to know the properties of peptide bond is crucial. Again, it's all understanding, right? You can't memorize that. And then struct structural hierarchy in proteins. So here we'll talk about uh, various folds, various uh, common three-dimensional motifs that proteins adopt uh, to, uh, to minimize negative interactions, maximize positive interactions, and so on and so forth. We'll talk about structure and function of fibrous proteins globular proteins so these are two different kinds of proteins one are developed for strength and globular proteins are mostly enzymes water soluble and then uh, so once we've done that so then we'll talk about how proteins actually fold right so as i mentioned to you on the ribosome proteins are produced as a string long string unfolded and then something helps it find its correct native fold and so we'll talk about what does help a protein find a correct, correct fold. Because if the protein is misfolded, it's not gonna be functional and that will cause disease. Okay. So proteins have lots of lots of single bonds, right? Remember when you have two atoms, right? One atom and another, they come together. There's a single bond. There's free rotation about, carbon, about single bonds, not just carbon, carbon, but carbon, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and so on and so forth. Free rotation. So can you imagine if you have um, a large protein with lots of these single bonds, can you imagine how many possible conformations a protein can adopt, right? And yet only one or maybe a couple of these conformations will have the function, will have the desired function. So uh, three-dimensional conformation is the key to understanding the function of the protein. And so this structure that uh, is responsible for this function, so we'll call it the native fold. Now let me get the pen native fold right so basically native stands for it's the uh the function the, the the fold that the protein adopts that the nature gave it gave, gave to it to be functional and this native fold has a large number of favorable interactions within the protein now um you have to realize that this native fold is not easy to achieve and part of the problem is there's this entropy cost, right? So every time you have some kind of organization, so native fold, what that means is that the protein adopts, so every amino acid has a specific spot. Every amino acid has a specific interaction with another amino acid within the protein, right? Or has specific location within the protein or on the outside of the protein. And so that comes with the, at the entropy cost, right? So entropy, makes proteins totally wants wants to make the protein totally unfolded and um, also when the protein is totally unfolded you can keep keep in mind that uh, there are all these hydrophilic amino acids uh, talk about serine threonine lysine aspartate right so basically anything with the oxygens negative uh, nitrogens all that wants to interact with water 
to form hydrogen bonds with water. So there is a strong driving force for the protein to be unfolded. And so you have to overcome, you have to be able to overcome that to create a specific fold um, for a particular protein. In fact, there is even a number in general So delta G, delta G that separates folded folded minus delta G that um, is associated with unfolded state is actually very small for a large protein. It's only about 20 to 60 kilojoules per mole. That's a very small number. That's a very, um, very, uh, a number that doesn't give you a lot of confidence, right? It almost feels like the protein is ready to unfold at any point, right? So if you think about a hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond can, can be 20 kilojoules per mole. So what is that one hydrogen bond can actually be the difference between the folded and unfolded state? And it's possible, right? So uh, it's a very tight balance between the two and proteins always walk this narrow line between the, being folded and unfolded. And you can appreciate that uh, by what's the, what's the danger when you, have, um, when you have fever? What's the problem with having fever, high fever if you don't treat it? Treat it? Your proteins could denature? Proteins can denature, and what does denature mean? Denature means the protein will unfold, right? And they will unfold because of this low energy required for unfolding. So you raise the temperature just a little bit, and this will give you this will give you proteins just enough energy to unfold. And the proteins, once they unfold it, they will lose their function and stop uh, performing what this, the role that they're supposed to perform. So something to keep in mind. And uh, so interactions within the protein are crucial to keep the folded, to keep the native fold. And so we'll talk much more about that. Okay, what, what are these favorable interactions in proteins? So we talked about hydrophobic effect. So let me actually uh, go over this quickly again to summarize. Uh, so remember, the hydrophobic, hydrophobic effect is the release of water molecules from the structure salvation layer around the molecule as protein folds, as protein folds increases the net entropy. So remember that, um, let me write this down. So nonpolar groups, so the, fir the first one will be nonpolar groups. Nonpolar groups cluster, cluster together, cluster together. So if you remember this hydrophobic effect, it's about this uh, salvation, uh, salvation layer, right? Where the molecules of water have to organize themselves around the hydrophobic residues. And if you minimize the hydrophobic surface area by making them cluster together, you will minimize the salvation layer. So the key word here is the salvation layer and you want to minimize that, right? Structured salvation layer. And um, that will help you increase the net entropy. All right, hydrogen bonds. 
So here, uh, obviously, um, these hydrogen bonds that you have within the protein, you want these hydrogen bonds to be, so for a protein to maintain its, its native fold, these NH groups and carbonyl groups, where do you want them to be? Do you want them to be on the outside of the protein? Or do you want them to be inside of the protein? So let's say you have a the protein is a sphere, right? So you want these NH ends and carbonyl ends. So where do you want them to be? Do you want them to be on the outside or inside of the pr protein? Can you think about this conceptual question? Inside? Mm hmm Inside the protein. And how do you make them? How do you... Um, move them from the inside sorry from the outside into the inside how can you move these hydrogen bonding capable uh, groups with hydrogen bonding capability inside the protein they form the alpha helixes or the sheets and they angle themselves inside the core right so when they form alpha helices so we'll talk about that so in other words, um, and in the alpha helix, what, what's the driving force behind the alpha helix? What's the main interaction that allows you to form an alpha helix? Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds, that's right. So what you wanna do is you want to minimize the number of groups that have no partners. So in other words, you want every carbonyl inside the protein to be bonded to every NH group inside the protein. Because if you, if you leave a hydrogen bonding capable residue inside the protein, it will increase the energy because this hydrogen bonding residue will want to go on the outside to bond to water. So let's write this down, very important. So for hydrogen bonding, so the number of H bonds number of H bonds inside protein is maximized. In other words, do not leave Do not leave age bonding residues without partners. without partners. In other words, if you have hydrogen bond donor, you want a hydrogen bond acceptor nearby. Partners. All right, what else do we have here? London dispersion forces. So remember, those are important if they're um, if the atoms are brought close enough together so london forces operate at short distances and that's exactly what is needed for us because once you squash all these amino acids hydrophobic amino acids uh, within the protein. So remember, this is going to be associated with um, induced dipole, right? So hydrophobic residues will participate in that. 
So London dispersion forces and also dipole-dipole interactions. So one is a transient dipole, the other is a permanent dipole, right? Plus dipole-dipole are maximal. are maximal at 0 0.3 to 0.6 nanometers. Nano. How many meters is that? How many meters are in one nanometer? It's just 10 to the negative nine. Mm -hmm. Negative nine, correct. All right, and then electrostatic interactions. So these are interactions between permanently charged groups. And for electrostatic interactions, um, here what we have to look at is what's known as salt bridges. Salt. bridges. Remember, salts are interactions between ions, all right? That's why they call salt bridges. And now, um, here, uh, something for you to look up. We're not going to go in great detail, but, but some phenomenon, uh, a term that um, we need to know, which was covered actually in general chemistry, but um, it's been a while, known as dielectric constant. Anybody remembers what dielectric constant is? Dielectric constant. Basically, the larger it is, the higher the ability of a medium to shield to shield the charge, the electric constant. So this will be epsilon, like that, the electric constant. So uh, obviously water, right? Because water is very polar, and so it's very hard for for electric charge to propagate through water, because water will. Um, absorb the charge or stop the charge propagation very quickly because it's very polar, right? So the charge will dissipate very quickly in a polar medium. So in water, in water, this epsilon equals 80. In the, uh, so uh, if you have the hydrophobic protein environment within the protein, within the protein where there is no water, remember the electric constant is the smallest in vacuum, right? within protein where there is no water it can it can be as low as four so obviously if you have this salt bridge within the protein the salt bridge is going to be much stronger within the protein because the dielectric constant will not be able to shield the charges so much right so the negative charge of let's say of aspartate, like a salt bridge, we have a, let's say aspartate interacting with arginine. 
this will form a soul bridge, right? So one is negative, permanently negatively charged, one is permanently positively charged. And so in water, they will interact, but not very strongly. The water will um, shield the, the charge contact, but within the protein, the dielectric constant is very small. And so these two will interact very strongly. All right, any questions to this point? So are there are other salt yeah. bridges other than aspartate and arginine that we need to know. Say it again, sorry. Is there other uh, salt bridges other than aspartate and arginine that we need to that we need to know? Well, the two negative, the two permanently negatively charged amino acids are aspartate and glutamate, right? And the two permanently positively charged are lysine and arginine. And histidine sometimes, depending on the situation. So, um, so for negatively charged, it will be aspartate. And glutamic acid, glutamate. For positively charged, it will be arginine. It will be lysine. And it will be histidine. So these are uh, all these are capable of of um, forming a soul bridge. Okay, so uh, as far as three-dimensional structure of proteins, so there are four levels of protein structure that um, we will be discussing in great detail. So one of them we just finished, right? Primary structure. So this, is, this is basically the sequence of, of amino acids, right? The primary structure. And don't forget about something that we didn't talk about in lecture, but was, we ran out of time, but it's on a slide. One of the slides I sent you, and it's also on sapling. Edmund degradation, right? So very useful technique. Very useful technique to establish primary structure. And also MSMS. So if you miss those, please go back to the textbook and read about those. Must pick, must pick. All right, then the secondary structure. So these will be local structures, right? So usually stretches of amino acids. Uh, which will form some kind of, so we talked about just, just now about alpha helix. So here's, we have this alpha helix, right? So this will be a short segment. And uh, these alpha helices will then come together and form what's known as a tertiary structure. So this was secondary, right? So basically just the a local um, confirmation of, um, string of amino acids. Now that is tertiary structure as far as how these uh, alpha helices, and we'll, we'll talk about beta pleated sheets, how these are organized into the overall polypeptide chain. So this will be tertiary structure. And then quaternary structure, we'll talk about, we talked about multi subunit proteins, right? So here is, this is one subunit, how these various subunits come together uh, through non-covalent attachment, right? and interact with each other to give a functional protein. So four levels of structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. All right, so we start with the peptide bond. So this is the, the actual bones of the uh, protein chain, right? And so the structure of the protein will be dictated by the properties of the peptide bond. Well, partially, but, but primarily, right? So um, we talked about the resonance. So peptide bond is a resonance hybrid of two canonical structures. And uh, we just mentioned, I told you, so the, so the peptide bond, the amide bond is less reactive compared with esters, right? And I ask you to think about it. 
and there were some uh, ideas on discussion in the discussion section of canvas but uh, let's talk keep talking about that so why amides are more less reactive than esters and what makes them more stable okay so they're quite rigid and nearly planar and they exhibit a large dipole moment in a favored trans configuration so let's look at that so here's the amide bond right so this is the alpha carbon alpha carbon next to the carbonyl so we have the amide nitrogen, which is attached to another alpha carbon on the other side. And so this is the peptide bond, or the amide bond, right? So the nit nit nitrogen with the carbonyl and the four substituents. So each peptide bond basically engages, what, six atoms, right? So we have um, uh, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon alpha, carbon alpha, right? Six atoms involved in a peptide bond. Now, so there is this lone pair, nice lone pair that can move over towards the carbon. The pi electrons from the carbonyl oxygen move towards the oxygen. Don't forget the type of error, right? This is something I can throw on the test just to for you to um, um, keep fresh your knowledge of organic chemistry, right? Remember the difference between this arrow versus this? What's the difference, who remembers? The top one is for resonance structures and the bottom one's for equilibrium. Equilibrium, that's right. So uh, when you do the resonance structures, do not forget to use the right one, right? Because if you do this one, what that means is that you're dealing with two different species, two different molecules. And this is the same molecule, just showing that the electrons can be on the nitrogens, they can be on the oxygen, and in, in real life, the electrons are everywhere, right? So this is just one compound, just two different ways to represent it. And in this representation, so you have a positive charge on the nitrogen, negative charge on the oxygen. And obviously, then the electrons can, another resonance structure, if you want to draw another one, you can pull electrons back towards the nitrogen, and then it's going to be the carbon with the positive charge, right? So we can draw three different resonance structures for the amide bond. All right, so one thing about the amide bond, because of this resonance, right? So the electrons want to move back and forth. And remember, the electrons move along the p orbitals, right? So if this is nitrogen, this is carbon, this is oxygen, the electrons can only move if the p orbitals are parallel right which means the p orbitals cannot rotate so there is no rotation so uh, if i want to rotate let me actually get rid of this arrow and put my pen back if i want to rotate about this carbon nitrogen bond because now there's a double bond no way, there is no rotation. No rotation, why? Because the P orbitals will stop it from rotating. No rotation because of resonance. which makes the peptide bond planar. Right, so we talked about free rotation about single bonds, just a mo just the beginning of the lecture. But now, even though it looks like it's a single bond here, but it's certainly not a single bond here. And so this resonance contributor is quite significant to stop rotation about carbon-nitrogen bond. 
And so the emit bonds are planar. And that actually rigidifies the structure of proteins, right? So the proteins, uh, they are, um, flexible because there are a lot of uh, single bonds, but they could be even more flexible if there was free rotation about carbon nitrogen bond of the amide, but that's absent. So, so, uh, so rotation around peptide bond is not permitted due to resonance structure, but there are two other bonds which are connected to the alpha carbon where it's permitted. So here we have phi, so this is the angle around the alpha carbon amide nitrogen bond and psi, the angle around the alpha carbon and carbon new bond. Okay, let's look at the picture here. All right, so, um, so let's uh, zero in onto this, on this um, alpha carbon here, right? This alpha carbon. So from the alpha carbon, we have the nitrogen in one direction towards the amino terminus, right? and we have the carbonyl towards the carboxyl terminus. And this is where the free rotation is. Now, there is no free rotation here between this carbon and, and this nitrogen, which is a part of the amine bond. So you can see basically, if you go along the peptide chain, there are three repeating bonds, right? Nitrogen alpha carbon, alpha carbon carbonyl, amide. Nitrogen alpha carbon, alpha carbon carbonyl, amide. Nitrogen alpha carbon, alpha carbon carbonyl, amide. So uh, basically three um, sets of three bonds along the peptide backbone, but only two out of those three are rotatable. And so we designate the two angles, okay? Phi and psi. So phi will be the angle, uh, will be the angle which is the hydro angle that designates where exactly this hydrogen and this carbonyl are relative to uh, the rest of the peptide bond. So you can see here, so if we look at this axis here, nitrogen alpha carbon, right? So there is the peptide back backbone goes in this direction, right? goes in this direction and they goes in this direction. And what are they? They go in the exactly opposite directions and the angle is 180 degrees. The angle is 180 degrees and we call this fully extended, fully extended conformation. So in other words, if the peptide if the peptide chain wasn't fully extended, now some people also refer to this as zigzag, right? Zig, zag. So basically up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? So in this fully extended conformation, the angle here is gonna be 180 degrees. And so, um, and so the, the phi is equals 180 degrees in the full extended conformation. Now, if you start rotating about this carbon nitrogen bond, then the phi will change. The phi will change. What else is uh, of, of note here? Uh, let's look at the distances, very important. So the distance between uh, two carbons here in, in a single bond is about 1.5 angstroms. Anybody remembers um, how many meters one angstrom is? How many meters is one angstrom? Is it 10 to the negative 10? That's right, 10 to the negative 10. 10 to the negative 10 meters. And it's not in, in um, it's not an SI, the uh, unit, right? So this will be 0 0.1, 0 0.1 nanometer. 0 0.1 nanometer. 
So uh, the reason why this is useful is uh, it's primarily for X-ray crystallography because it's very convenient to deal with these numbers because they're very close to one, right? You can see here, single bond, 1.5 angstroms. Now a double bond here, we know from, from organic chemistry and general chemistry that double bonds are shorter, right? So there are more electrons which tie these carbon and oxygen together. Double bonds are shorter and it will be 1.2 angstroms. And you can see here, this carbon nitrogen bond which has partial double bond character, right? It could be a single in one resonance structure here, right? And this resonance structure is single. In this resonance structure, it's double. So it's exactly in between, right? So 1.32 angstroms. So it's not a single bond, not a double bond. It's somewhere in between. That's another important observation we can make. So what else? You have any questions about this zigzag conformation and phi and psi? Let's see. Um, let's go back. So the uh, so phi the angle around the alpha carbon amide nitrogen, psi the angle alpha carbon carbonyl carbon. In a full extended polypeptide, both both phi and psi are 180 degrees. And so the organization around the peptide bond paired with the identity of the R groups determines the secondary structure of the protein. Right, so, so for the secondary structure of the protein, what we have to look for is this phi and psi, depending on where they are, right? Compared for the deviation. Now remember, if they're both 180, then we'll have a full extended zigzag form. If they deviate from 180, then a different conformation is adopted by the polypeptide chain. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so the 180 fully extended zigzag pattern that will set the rigidity, rigidity, I guess that's how you say it, of the backbone, the polypeptide. Is that what that means? So the rigidity will come from the fact that there is no free rotation about carbon nitrogen of the amide bond. Right. So, uh, so there is another, uh, there is another. Uh, angle, which is sometimes used, which is omega. Omega, which is this. But the omega is almost always 180 degrees. It very, very rarely deviates from it. Right? So basically, you can see this going one way, and this goes the other way. And the reason why it doesn't deviate is because there are very, very, very little rotation about this nitrogen and carbonyl carbon uh, uh, atoms, right? Because of the partial double bond character. That's why omega is rarely used because it's uh, it's almost 100% in all proteins, 180 degrees. Well, we will see that. Well, it's 99.66 something. We will see that actually in prolins, that's not the case. So some prolin and some prolins, omega can be actually zero. But for the other amino acids, it's nearly always 180. And so that's what confer that's what makes the protein backbone rigid, right? So there's no free rotation about this carbon nitrogen bond. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. And let's finish with this, what's called um, Ramachandran plot. So some phi and psi combination is very favorable, unfavorable, sorry, because of steric crowding of the backbone atoms with other atoms in the backbone side chain. So if you look, about, look at this uh, structure again, so there is a lot of these side chains, R and R, right? So this R is towards us, that R is away from us, towards us, away from us. So obviously, um, if you change the psi and phi, then you will change also the distance and the steric crowding between the R groups, right? So, um, so not all phi and psi's are accessible. And so some of the combinations are more favorable, right? To avoid, um, and some of them favorable to form favorable H bonding interactions along, along the backbone. And so there is what there is a scientist who actually came up with this plot, Ramachandran, 
who actually basically shows that there is distribution of this fine psi that are found in a protein. And so based on this, by looking at um, fine psi in a, in a protein, you know what particular three-dimensional structure uh, this protein adopts. Okay, let's look at that. So, uh, so here is the various combinations of phi on the horizontal axis from mi minus 180 to plus 180, right? So both are zigzag. So along this axis, uh, vertical axis, that's zigzag, and this is zigzag too. And zero will be uh, not trans, but cis peptides, right? If the peptides were trans earlier, now the, if it's zero, the peptides will be cis. And so most proteins, uh, most accessible conformations are actually located in this upper left corner. Not so much, right? So if, if, if this is the all possible combinations of phi and psi, you can see that actually in real life, proteins actually occupy a very small um, portion of this uh, possible plot, right? Actually, the darker the blue, the more common uh, the motif is, right? So you can see here, so we will uh, talk about the alpha helix starting at the next lecture. But you can see here, so right-handed alpha helix, this is where we find that, right? So, uh, so the proteins in which this, this local arrangement is such that the psi is minus 60 and phi is somewhere between minus what minus 160 and minus 40 somewhere there right so this will give you right-handed alpha helix this will be left-handed alpha helix now we'll talk about anti-parallel and parallel beta sheets right so these are associated with some specific phi and psi and localized here and then we'll talk about um, collagen triple helix so collagen triple helix is slightly different from the right-handed alpha helix. And um, so we'll talk about that too. Okay, any questions about Ramachandran plot? Yeah, so when we talk about three-dimensional structure of a particular protein, it would be useful to look at this Ramachandran plot and it will tell, tell us how different uh, parts of the protein where they localized in terms of phi and psi. All right, so I'll upload this lecture on YouTube, start studying, and I will, um, sometime later today, I will open the new sapling homework, okay? Um, I do acknowledge that I may have overdone it with math a little bit on the last one, so we'll keep that in mind. I'll try to uh, switch more into conceptual area in terms of sapling. And um, that's my homework. And are there any questions? Any more questions about anything? All right. And uh, please, more participation, guys, in the discussion forum of the Canvas. Let's learn all together. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'll talk to you on Wednesday. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.